Hey, Scott, can they hear us now? Yes. Okay. Yes, they can. I hope they can.
We all want to know where we came from. Everybody asks that question. And also, could life exist elsewhere? A little piece of the puzzle is actually, if you want to look for life on other icy worlds other than Earth, then you have to understand life on Earth first. It beautifully simulates how a hydrothermal system under the right pressure and temperatures would flow continually. Everything requires energy input, especially when you're talking about organic synthesis. The great thing about these hydrothermal vents is you have a lot of free energy already there. You really can start to link up these organic molecules and form longer chains, and those longer chains are really the key to getting to DNA synthesis. It's all worth it to really show how you can test these reactions almost to the same scale that you have on the bottom of the ocean. It's very rewarding to see it really come about and come to fruition. We're starting to just explore these icy moons and icy worlds where you could possibly be reproducing the same things that we find on Earth today with these rock-water interactions. So it's important for understanding how do we search for life on other planets and also how did life actually begin here on Earth. Well, hello everybody. It's uh, Scott Roberts and Kent Martz here uh, from Explore Scientific. Let me adjust my camera just a little bit here. There we go. Uh, we got kicked out of the showroom today because of, um, well, there was just another program going on. So uh, we have uh, been utilizing, uh, uh, you know, live uh, uh, meeting rooms and Zoom and Skype and all kinds of things to interact with our customers. and. Uh, so, uh, and the showroom's a great place to do it, so we get it when we can get it. <laughs> but um, today, Kent's just sitting at his desk. How do you feel just broadcasting from your desk again? This is where it all started. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a place with a camera and a microphone. That's all you need. Every That's place right. is a broadcast studio. It doesn't have to be fancy. That's it just right. has to work. It just has to work. That's right. That's right. So uh, last night we did the uh, 19th Global Star Party, which was a lot of fun, um, uh, even though there was still, you know, it was still kind of uh, uh, tense as far as election uh, results coming in and stuff like that. Uh, we still got a nice viewing audience. It was great. Um, uh, we had uh, Norman Fulham play guitar for us, which was beautiful, you know, poetry from David Levy. Um, and, uh, you know, it was great to have, uh, uh, you know, Jason Gonzal jo join us and show some amazing images. Uh, Cesar Brolo was there uh, getting live images of Mars. Actually, he was getting some decent detail uh, with his little telescope setup that he had going on. He always just sets things up on his balcony up on this, uh, you know, I don't know, 12th floor or something in this building where he's at. Um, and uh, who else do we have? Of course, we had uh, Livy and the Stars, Deep T, Gautam, and uh, David Levy and David Eicher. <clears throat> With David Eicher's uh, segment on what happens or how long will we have uh, to have life still here on Earth, you know? So it was, uh, 
was interesting that the the figure came in around a billion years. Now, you know what that means as far as life on Earth. Uh, you know, probably probably happen in uh, stages, but you know, who knows what happens a billion years from now? We may be living all over our solar system by that time, and maybe on you know other solar systems. Who knows? Uh, it's a long time from now. So, and the rate of our technology, you know, our increase in technology, yeah, you would say, well, maybe that's impossible. But I would tell you that, uh, you know, 200 years ago that uh, me holding a cell phone in my hand and doing live video broadcasting from it would have been impossible. You know, they wouldn't even know, you know, it would have been something from uh, science fiction, you know. So uh, anyhow, um, but uh, uh, we... Um, uh, you know, it was overall, it was a, it was a good uh, star party. We're having another star party uh, Saturday morning. It's the Asian edition with, uh, co-hosted by Christopher Go, And uh, so that starts here at about 6 a.m. Uh, Central Time. So if you're up for it, uh, you wake up early on a Saturday morning, you can check us out. But um, uh, Ken, what it, where are we at uh, for this segment of uh, First Light Chronicles? I think that we... We uh, challenge you for $750 and under, and um, so what did you come up with? Well, you made it tough. That $750 price point is sort of in a, in a gapper, but I did come up with something. I came up with the Explorer First Light 127-millimeter Maxitov Cassegrain telescope on a Twilight One mount, uh, which is an uh, altitude, alt-as, altitude azimuth mount, tripod, left, right, up, down. Okay. Uh, has a long focal length, 1,900 millimeters, mm-hmm. just like the 100 millimeter Mac Cassegrain we talked about on Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be good for planets, good for the moon, good for the brighter uh, Messier objects. Um, comes with a 90 degree diagonal, a 25 millimeter plus, a light piece, a red dot finder, a smartphone camera adapter, and I was able to hit the bullseye at 749.99, so right at $500. Okay. Add the Tyrian multi-latitude planetosphere and the Astro R light red light flashlight uh, for $29.99. We're at $780. So I went over with the extras. So, you know, it is what okay. it is. Yeah. Right. It is what right. it is. Yeah. But uh, those are all, those are all things that are needed. You know, the thing is, is that um, uh, a lot of people feel like, okay, I got the telescope. I have all that I need. Well, it's, it's not true. You, you do need charts. You do need um, uh, some of the little ancillary things that just make uh, life a little bit more comfortable. I mean, other things that that uh, we don't talk about uh, generally is uh, you know things that you need like a little portable table. You know, uh, a uh, so a lot of my friends would not think of going to a star party without something called a, a zero gravity chair. You know, where they recline back and they're they're relaxed and they have their binoculars and they're out there looking at the milky way um you know uh, a lot of my friends will do that where they'll set up a big scope or a couple of big scopes uh and they'll have their zero gravity chairs out there and uh you know have their music playing in the background and have some hot drink or cocktail or whatever you know and then uh, when it's uh, no one's at the eyepiece, they'll go up there and check out what's in the eyepiece and come back to their chair with the binoculars and stuff. It's a pretty relaxing evening, you know. Well, and now with automated astrophotography, astrophotography systems that you can program what's going to happen and the automated systems they have, once that stuff starts, it's fairly easy to sit there and either do visual while it's running its routine or just, like you said, sit back in a chair and use chill binoculars out. and chill out and just just take in the milky way or work on your messy objects list or whatever you want to do i mean there's a lot of options and then go check your telescope make sure everything's going and those automatic routines just keep running and capturing your data it's 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 a good way to get a lot of relaxation in but cover a lot of sky too that's true that's true let's see who's on with us today um we have uh, James, the astrophotographer. He, he had an accident, uh, which was too bad. Uh, knocked his rig into the ground, uh, which is a drag. Um, Pekka's uh, watching from Stockholm, Sweden. Thank you for watching and checking us out. 
uh, Michael Whitaker's on with us, um, Jeff Wise, um, Dale Beasley's on, uh, Richard Grace, who else? Mm -hmm. All of y'all right now, share this stream to your friends. <laughs> All of y'all. All of y'all. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> like, share, uh, ring the little bell. bell. Yeah. But Wade Prunty's watching us. Tim Myers. Shailendra Sharma's watching. Ollie Crabtree's watching. Uh, he says, I think that the human population will have significantly decreased in less than 200 years' time. Well, you know, we're overpopulated now, so maybe it's not such a horrible thing. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, Richard Grace is suggesting somebody joins the Explore Alliance and save a few bucks on your package. Thank you very much, Richard. Marco Polo, when will you announce the 100 degree eyepiece winner? Uh, me? It, it gets announced on the uh, next star party. Uh, no, no. Uh, this is for the hundred. This is for the hundredth anniversary. It'll be announced by um, by Jerry Hubble tomorrow. That's oh, okay. Be announced. Yeah, it's on that program. So we're just on our fourth program for uh, First Light Chronicles, uh, the Open Go To community. We did a hundred programs already. So that's amazing. <clears throat> it really is. It went by fast. Yeah. Um, Mike Wiesner says I have a. Bench outside of my observatory that I relax on. It is so enjoyable to watch the stars come out after sunset. Also great to take a break from the telescope and use binoculars. That's true. Um, <laughs> Tim Meyer says, the plural of y'all is all y'all. That's, <laughs> that's, that's where I went. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Rachel says, hello from uh, Waldeboro, Maine, USA. So... Uh, great to have you watching, Rachel. Uh, Jeff Wise is, uh, is watching, and Stefan Del Pra says good morning. So, um, uh, Stefan, I think that uh, you were telling me that you would you are um, uh, in Australia, and uh, mentioned that if you wanted to take um, you know advantage of being on the uh, you know Global Star Party, that we'll have our first. Asian edition on Saturday. That might work out for you on Saturday evening for you. So let me know. Chuck Lewis says Alabamese. <laughs> I speak hillbilly is that, sometimes. Is there like a dog that's an Alabamese dog? Probably not. Yeah. I, I speak hillbilly sometimes. My hillbilly. Relatives, <laughs> my relatives were, I, I honest to gosh, have a cousin yeah. who was named huck collins and uh, huck. Huck, huck and and he went barefooted all the time unless there was snow on the ground and then he wore shoes um and wow. uh raised raised people come to visit you're supposed to bring sugar coffee or tobacco raised everything else himself lived off the land i would have loved to spend some time with him if i'd been yeah, a little that, bit older actually it would have been a you know, that's true. And, and I, also, I, I had cousins um, when I was living in Texas. We're from Texas, you know, and uh, we had cousins living here in Arkansas. And I do remember going to their home when I was a little kid and they lived on a big farm and stuff like that. They did not have running water in that house. We, we had to pump. I remember pumping the, the thing out the front yard. You know, they had uh, outhouses. Um, uh, but you want to see some kids that had a lot of fun, man. They had a bunch of kids, and we just play like crazy. So it was fun. It was. Huck, Huck grew a lot of corn, not for eating. Oh. He might have converted into a more sellable crop than corn. <laughs> a, a reduction of corn, right? Yes. I so see. Some fermentation may have been involved in copper right. pots. Right. That's right. Yes. So... You want to go ahead, Scott? No, I'm just looking at the the uh, comments here. Wade says in Alabama, where your car might not have wheels, but your house will. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, so you know I've been doing two episodes or two deals per episode, so okay, you know, I want it's to continue deal that deal number trend. two. So that okay, so the first deal, recap that again. Okay, the first deal, 
first the deal. first light, the first light, 127 millimeter Maxitov Cassegrain okay. telescope on a Twilight One mount, which is a simple alt as. Okay. Plop it down, left, right, up, down. Um, it doesn't have a. It's not an equatorial <laughs> mount, so you can have slow motion controls that that allow you to follow it in an easy curve. But the Twilight One mount does have slow motion controls uh, that allow you to, to turn it slowly and not have to reach up and grab the mount and move it like a like a camera tripod. Right. Very precise control of, of the telescope or of the mount to point the telescope. What can so, you see with a five inch? This is a five inch Maxitov. So what's the visual experience going to be like? Visual experience is going to be really good views of the moon and planets because of its magnification. Uh, lots of people use you know, uh, Maxitov Cassegrains or Schmidt Cassegrains to take planetary images. Mm -hmm. uh, as Heath Creek more found out, he was trying to use a 102 to uh, take a picture of Mars. He got surface detail, but the image scale is so small, even with a planetary camera, you've got to have that greater focal length. Magnification comes from the focal length. Yeah. The longer it is, you know, 720 millimeters, you know, focal length like that, you know, 1900 millimeters is like that a lot of focal length that's it's a true. lot of focal length in a telescope <clears throat> only about that long because the light path folds up inside because of a series of mirrors and so you know the planets are going to look real good especially if you have good seeing conditions and by seeing conditions i mean the out this the sky is stable mm -hmm. not a lot of dust not a lot of uh temperature variations in this in the sky if you look up on some nights and you notice the stars don't twinkle, that's a really good indication that the good scene one. has become very good and steady. And when that happens, you can really start pouring on the magnification through higher and higher powered eyepieces uh, to really get some some good views of, of uh, the moon and the planets specifically. Uh, it'll be good for your brighter M objects, the Pleiades, uh, Orion Nebula, <coughs> excuse me um you know the stuff with low surface so, brightness so you can do deep sky objects with it right do deep sky objects with it and you know that's a challenge to to sit there and go okay how deep can i go you know can i see uh mm -hmm. m101 or m105 or you know a ring nebula is going to look real good in that telescope uh you know and so we, we all throw out these things and i don't want to assume that people out there know M objects, Messier objects, are named after a French guy, Charles. If you grew up in Arkansas or Al speak Alabamese, his name was probably Charles Messier, M-E-S-S-I-E-R. And, you know, you pronounce it Messier until you realize it's French and learn to, to French, Anglo, what would it be? Anyway, Francophile it. Uh, it becomes Messier. Messier. He, was looking for, he was looking for comets. He yep. started this list of things that weren't comets back in the 1700s. And uh, um, that list is now through his really modern good telescope in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he knew these things weren't comets because they didn't move. Well, now with our good entry level telescopes, which are vastly better than his telescopes, the M objects become a really good entryway into uh, learning the sky. They're from the North Pole to the Southern horizon in the Northern hemisphere. In all the constellations, you can see some. You can see <clears throat> sixty to seventy every single night of the year when it's clear. Sure. Um, you know, and weirdly, in this span between March and April, yeah. you can see all of them if you stay up all night. It's called a Messier marathon. If you there's three or four, they're really hard to get in the evening, and three or four, they're really hard to get in the morning. Yeah. But you can see stars that are all the way around the sky in a less than a full day. And it's really a strange thing of geometry, but once you understand it, it's pretty cool. So anyway, Scott's left, but I'm going to go ahead. No, and, I'm still here. Oh. <laughs> I just, I was getting parched, you know, after uh, all that. Uh, had to go for some water. And the Southern. southern so so draw. anyway, <laughs> Southern draw y'all. Okay. So, so the second one, I veered off course from the first light and yeah. we have what we've begun to call our second light program. Now, first light is a brand. Yeah. Second light is a program. And we have a lot of telescopes. We have a trade in trade up program that we offer anyone. And you can send uh, in your explore scientific 
branded first light branded telescope and we will make an offer to you on it. Yeah. And then that applies as a credit for buying something else. And a lot of those telescopes are not, you know, in perfect condition, but they're still in really usable condition. And we're going to call those well, second per light. Perfectly usable right. and, and fully warranted. And I'm, I was going to get, exactly. <laughs> yep. It comes with a full mechanical, full optical warranty. It does not come with a mechanical, a cosmetic warranty uh, because it's been used. And so, but it's still a perfectly good telescope. And a person, and I talk to people about this who, who call me and talk about it. If you want to take the time to put it on whatever social media platform you want and deal with people calling and emailing and having to come by and shipping it across the country and then saying, oh, well, the lens has a big scratch on it. And they're like, no, it doesn't. And you, they say, well, yes, it does. And it comes back and it's got a big scratch on it. You send it to us. You can make more money on the open market. But when you sell on the open market, you don't have to warranty it. So when we buy it, we're offering you a quick guaranteed deal. You don't have to deal with all those people. You don't have to deal with the shipping two or three times. And so the, what the benefit we offer is a quick guaranteed deal. Yeah. A lot of people are really busy too, and they just don't have the time to devote to trying to sell off their telescope. So, right. Um, but, so, anyway. yeah, but we do have these telescopes. And, so, and there will be more of them getting listed on the, on the, it's a new program. We're going to get them listed on the website at some point, but mm -hmm. this is a deal we're offering. And uh, this is a deal through Explore Scientific. Um, Explore Scientific created a telescope for Costco, the warehouse club. And as you, many, you all may know, Costco will take anything back for any reason. <clears throat> and so we've got, a number of these Costco Dobsonian telescopes back. They're 10 inch truss tube Dobsonians that are based on uh, the uh, uh, 10 and 12 inch truss tube Dobsonians that we yeah, have. There's only a slight difference. There's a, there's a cosmetic change on the secondary cage. The secondary. Where, instead of being open, it's just got a metal shroud around it, which right. actually, frankly, is better. Um, yeah. keeps out stray light uh, and then the side bearings are instead of being painted yellow they're painted white right. aside from that it's the same exact optics uh, comes comes with a same optics comes with a one single speed focuser so right. if, if you instead want to go two speed and it's not a two speed focuser and you can't put a 10 to 1 knob on it so it re would require an upgrade but great again but We're it's still about, a two inch. It is still a two inch focus. Yes, though. that's correct. Yeah. So, right. and, and we're talking about starter <clears throat> telescopes here. And that's why I went down this route is because, you know, it, it doesn't have a lot of fancy bells and whistles. It's just a, a good light bucket. Dobsonian telescopes are called light buckets because they offer a really big aperture for not yeah. a lot of money. Right. So we talked about the warranty. Oh, it comes with a 25 and 10 millimeter plus light pieces. Mm -hmm. A Bresser 70 degree, 15 or 20 millimeter eyepiece, uh, a digital eyepiece. So you can hook it up to your computer and take pictures or watch things slide by. Uh, a mood map, a planisphere, a two power Barlow, a red dot finder, and a two inch to 1.25 inch eyepiece adapter. Mm -hmm. Now that's a whole bunch of stuff. That's a <clears throat> bunch of kit, right? We're talking about, you know, Scott gave me a benchmark of, $750. I blew through that, blew under it, just like my hair was on fire. 500 bucks, $499.99. So um, I'm going to recommend a Telrad finder because, yeah. you know, Telrad is a, is a great finder and for $39, hard to beat. And because this is a trust tube Dobsonian, also, the shroud, which is sort of made out of sort of like this T-shirt material I'm wearing that goes on under it that makes it a solid tube for 80 bucks. So we get in, even with those extras, 618 call it $620. We'll just round up to $620, okay? So the shroud. People say, well, why do I need a shroud? It looks cool without the shroud. That shroud... Well, Mar Marco, Marco Polo, who's watching here, bought one of them. He loves the telescope. He says, don't forget the shroud. <laughs> okay. Very, thank you, Marco, for, for giving me a plus one on this. 
-hmm. because the shroud serves as a dew shield because that open mirror is going to collect dew if you don't shield it. So the shroud serves as a dew shield. It also serves as a light covering. So yeah. that stray light that comes in, even starlight in, on really dark, dark sky sites, that starlight coming in and reflecting off and bouncing around inside the telescope reduces the contrast in the eyepiece. And so by putting that shroud around it, you eliminate all the extraneous light. And if you live, if you're living in your backyard where there's a street light nearby, that will really degrade the contrast. And by the contrast, the sky won't look black, it'll look gray. And so you're looking at something that's already a gray or a, a, a brighter tone. And that contrast range is getting shorter and shorter between the black and the white. And so that shroud for 80 bucks is, is, is worth it on a trust any trust tube up sodium so that's where i stand the question is how do you get that deal right now at this moment anyway and hopefully we can cure this tomorrow because we just talked about this a while ago call customer service or email us at service at explorescientific.com service at explorescientific.com give us your phone number we'll give you a ring and one of the customer service agents will be glad to set you up uh, with yeah. with one of these uh, second light Costco Dobsonian telescopes, and, and this is what the scope looks like. So I'm showing, sharing my screen right now. Yep, and uh, you can see some of the different features of it. This is a substantial telescope, and at ten inches of aperture, you can see well into things like uh, from a dark sky sight. You can definitely see the. Uh, um, you know the Virgo cluster of galaxies. You can, you if you're a good observer, you can see Stevens Quintet. Um, you can see galaxies that are, you know, upwards of 100 million light years away. You know, if you know where you're looking. Um, with a 10-inch telescope, the faintest, furthest away thing I've ever seen, okay, is uh, an object called 3C273, and that is a distant quasar. I think it's like 3.5 billion light years away okay so that's that's uh and it looked like a faint blue star and i thought gosh you know maybe those uh quasars look like something different in the palomar 200 inch for example they don't they're so far away they still look like pinpoints of light they're blue color um and uh that's that you know through the very largest telescopes around uh that's that's how those quasars look so where were you when you saw that scott Palomar uh, Observatory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So put put in the phone number and the email address so they can, uh, people want to jump in on this fantastic yeah. deal on the Costco Dobsonian. Uh, they can do that. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, so this is our, this is our phone number. Okay. And if you'd like to jump in on that deal, uh, you can just send an email to explorealliance at explorescientific.com. Yeah, we'll just use that one, Explore Alliance. There you go. <clears throat> you know, I've had some, I really enjoy using Dobsonian telescopes. Um, you Me know, too. And, and we had the, the 20 inch out in the parking lot, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. It's in December, so it's been two years ago. And, uh, uh, Clint Bram and I were out there, and Scott, I think you were here, and uh, was looking at the moon with a 100 degree. Oh, I was. Point, this yeah, is when point. we were out front, right? Yeah. Right. And and I will tell you that with that 20 inch dob on the moon at 600 power, and then we put a three millimeter in. I think it kicked it up to 900 power still was very steady we could have put a two power focal extender on it got probably got an 1800 power hmm. it, there's a video out there of me almost starting to cry it was a it was a truly astounding experience to <clears throat> see that but again we're talking about a a mirror that's yay big too you know and weighs 120 pounds but it was pretty cool but even with a 10 inch telescope or an 8 inch dob you know it's fantastic views. Now, for the people who have never used a Dobsonian telescope, there is a skill called collimation that you have to learn. 
And but I just refer, hard. it's not it's, hard. It's and, not hard. And people read about using lasers and Cheshire eyepieces and got to be perfect. And they get this, this idea that everything has to be perfect. Right. And, and, you know, we've all heard the management term, don't let good enough get in the way of perfect. Right. Well, for this, don't let perfect get in the way of good enough to use yeah. the telescope. <laughs> right. And I know people, they <clears throat> literally, they'll call in and say, well, I can't get it collimated. I said, well, have you used the telescope? No, it's not collimated. Well, it does this. Have you used the telescope? No. Well, why don't you go use the telescope and just look and see? It doesn't have to be perfect. I literally just line it up with my eyeball. And Scott, I know you do the same thing. And yeah, if you'll Google uh, Gary Saronic uh, collimation, um, there is a, uh, um, a great tutorial by a guy named Gary Saronic that shows you how to do it without any tools. And it's literally just a matter of understanding when you take the eyepiece out and look in the eyepiece you see a series of circles and literally your whole job is to just get those circles lined up so they stack up on top of each other evenly around each other so very concentric and that's all there is to it you can get more complicated and if you're going to do astrophotography then yes it does need to be really well collimated but the human eye has this wonderful capacity to deal with things that the camera does not. Right. That's true. That's true. But, you know, getting it collimated really well is, is not a big chore. Uh, Marco says he uses, he did buy a laser collimator for his and he collimates it in under five minutes, you know, so. Mm. And, and something that's cool about this telescope, it comes with most times the collimated Dobsonian requires two people, one at the eyepiece, yeah, this is and then that secondary is this. so far away that you you I mean unless you're like a in an NBA basketball player with this really long wingspan of arms, you mm -hmm. can't reach those. And so you're in the eyepiece, and you have a friend who's turning the screws that moves that mirror to get it lined up just right. Yeah, this telescope and the Explore Scientific Trust Tube Dobbs in general come with this really unique and. Is it unique to ours, Scott? Has have you ever seen anything like it before? No, no. So, uh, you know, it is. It, this telescope is designed by a Dob uh, telescope maker enthusiast in in Germany, and so uh, our our design team in Germany uh, worked very closely with this guy. Uh, that was one of the features was be able to sit at the eyepiece and with the wand touch the uh, collimation screws which are inside the tube okay so uh, now you got a you got a tool coming down and you're coming right by the mirror but there the the tool actually has like a little plastic apron so if you touch the mirror it's not a big deal okay you're not gonna you're not gonna hit it with uh with the tool okay um but that that cup goes right over the hex screw make that adjustment it is Hands down, the easiest, simplest way to collimate a Newtonian. And I'm really surprised that no one's come up with this design before. For real, it, it didn't come from Explore Scientific. Uh, we worked with this uh, German uh, uh, telescope maker, and um, it was his idea. I wish I remembered you know, his name. It was told to me at one time. We'll have to get it again. But uh, He deserves uh, a shout out. He, he does. He does because it's a great, it's a great way to do this. So. It's revolutionary. Yeah. I mean, it truly is revolutionary for Dobsonian telescopes. Yeah. It's so simple to use. So simple to use. Right. What, what comments yeah. you see in there, Scott? Uh, Jim Norwood says, that's the nice thing about a laser collimator. You can plug the laser into the eyepiece and make your adjustments at the base of the tube. Jim, on this one, you don't go down to the base of the tube. You stay up at where the eyepiece is and just use this wand. You never have to even bend over, okay? Maybe to, to pick up the, the wand. The telescope. Maybe to pick up the wand. Maybe if you drop it. the wand. <laughs> That's true. And literally, <laughs> you can sit at the eyepiece right. and collimate the telescope looking through the eyepiece. Right. And you just reach down there and you just go. We ought to do a show on that, Scott, to show that sometime. We will. We have videos of us doing it. You go, know, go, back to the, these telescopes. go back to the pictures and we can. Well, let's see. Did I close it all out? Maybe I did. Let's see. But Here this is, it's genius. This was a genius. 
design. Let's see. Oh, there's the so tool. This, yeah, this is the wand right here. Okay. And let's see if we have a picture. What is it, about 30 inches long, something like that? Something like that, yeah. So, so that there's thing. the plastic tip on the bottom. You can see the black on the bottom. And um, uh, it goes down. We don't have a good photo, but it goes. Yeah, there we go. There you, you can you go it. straight down the tube. And, and because this is a truss tube, you can reach in with that wand. Hey, Scott, then, you can see it. Put your cursor on it. Yeah. You can see yeah, right you there. Can, yep. You can see one of the screws right here and the other one's right here. So it's inside and it's tilting the mirror. And there's another one over here too. But one of them stays stationary while the other two toggle the, tel the primary mirror. These other screws up here do adjust the secondary, but almost, gosh, almost never do you go in there and mess with these knobs uh, for the secondary mirror. All that is supposed to do is capture all the light coming off that primary and making sure that it's going straight down the focuser tube. So that's that's how that works. <laughs> but genius idea. Yep. Genius idea. And a good looking telescope too. Very nice telescope. And okay, so let's talk a little bit about what can you see versus a five inch Mac versus a 10 inch Dob? Uh, under the sky is going to be the controlling factor in, 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 in most okay. instances. Let's say the Milky Way is like a storm cloud overhead. What is it going to look like? Uh, it's going to look like uh, diamonds just scattered out on a black velvet sky. If you've got, like going into winter, these cold winter nights when yeah. that sky, when it's brutally cold, the sky looks like black velvet and the, and the, and the stars don't, don't twinkle a bit. It's like diamonds just scattered on, on black velvet, you yeah. know. In the summertime, at, let's say like M51, what are you going to see from the five to the 10? You're going to see more detail. Uh, yeah. You're going to haul, haul. Basically, a telescope is the size of the telescope makes your pupil that big around. So, you know, so the aperture of the telescope, the diameter of the scope, takes it's like light. dilating your eye to whatever that is. That's correct. So, like, you know how owl's eyes get big and they can see better at night? Yeah. Well, imagine if your eyes were that big around or 10 inches around and right. you're looking through a 10 inch eyeball, all that light's getting smushed down and coming into a five millimeter, six millimeter exit and going into your eyeball, you're getting a massive amount more light. So because of that more light, uh, pi r squared, I could do the math, you know, you're three times the light roughly is coming into your eye as, as in the five inch. And so, um, a 300% increase. increase. Yeah. It is, I will tell you from, from direct experience, it is a huge difference, okay? It is a huge difference. The things that look like uh, almost barely perceptible in a 5-inch pop out in a 10-inch, you know? If you have really great seeing conditions, like uh, Kent was alluding to, that more aperture is going to let you see finer and finer detail on the moon, on Saturn's rings, on Jupiter. You're just going to resolve more detail. So with more aperture... You get greater light gathering power, and you also get more resolving power. A lot of people want to know what the power of a telescope is. Well, the power to see distance and the power to see detail is locked into the aperture, not the magnification, okay? Uh, the magnification just decides how big it's going to look in the eyepiece, okay? But um, uh, so, if, if you have those seeing conditions for it and it's stable, you're going to get way better uh, views through a 10 inch than so, you would through a five inch. So here's why. Um, a five inch telescope has, let's just call it 20 square inches of surface area. Okay. A 10 inch telescope has 78 and a half inches of uh, surface area. So you're going from 20 to 78 inches of aperture. And all that is getting squished down into your eye. So because of that, you know, you're looking at nearly three times the light coming into your eye. And that allows you to see things that are theoretically three times fainter. Mm -hmm. You know, and people talk about, well, well, how much magnification can I handle? And I use the rule of thumb of 
inches of aperture times 50. And that's a very conservative a estimate. Conservative number. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that ends up being, you know, at, at a five, you know, times it'd be 250 power, you know, and a 10 would be 10 inch would be 500 power. That's very conservative. I base that on living in light polluted skies and not having good seeing conditions. Mm -hmm. Under better seeing conditions, I think Scott, you use the 100 inches of aperture times 100, correct? Is that what you uh, use it's, it's, often? Yeah, when you have when you have a perfect sky, about every inch of aperture you can go up to about 100 power per inch. So I have used telescopes. Uh, I've used 10 inch telescopes over a thousand magnification. Okay. Really have to be dead on collimated. Sky's got to be dead calm. Okay. Uh, scope. No has wind. Be, no wind. It needs to be, uh, or you can have a slight wind. Like uh, oftentimes when we go to the winter star party in the Florida Keys, we have a straight line onshore uh, wind that's blowing across the Keys maybe it's, two, three miles an hour. Seeing conditions can be sub arc second. Okay. And it's very, it's a laminar, it's called laminar sea flow or something like that. Yeah. All the air from the bottom to way up is all the same temperature, all the, and just moving at the same speed. That's right. And one night I've told this story. I don't remember how high we had You've Jupiter. You've been out there. You've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Jupiter was dead overhead. Uh, mm -hmm. And we had Barlow on Barlow on Barlow on, um, on Paul Anderson's just trying 14 to inch. exceed the magnification possibility, and, and we yeah. and it, Jupiter literally looked like a picture. You could see the festooning in 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 the bands, and you could see multiple bands. It was it was truly astounding. People were coming up and saying, "Okay, somebody said somebody had Jupiter at like you know sixteen hundred power. Where, where is that at?" They didn't believe us, and right. they were dumbfounded. You know when they saw. Well, if they've never Arlo's seen like that. really great, if they've never been in conditions where there's great seeing conditions. Yeah. You know, most people, most people get you know on a good quiet night maybe two arc second seeing. Okay, something yeah. like that, which is pretty good. Um, but uh, you get down to the arc second or sub arc second range, suddenly you start to notice there's a lot more double stars out there than than there was before. Um, you know, the uh, planetary detail is incredible. Everything looks better because it's just really, really still, you know. And the amazing thing is this is at the Winter Star Party where you're two feet above sea level or yeah. five feet above sea level, right? right. Not on top of a 10 or 12,000 or 14,000 foot mm -hmm. mountain. That's right. You're looking through so much less atmosphere. You're at sea level and you're still getting sub arc second scene, you know, right. it's spectacular. That's true. That's very true. Let's see what kind of comments we have here. Uh, Mike Wiesner saying, you know, if you're, I, I think he's uh, responding to uh, high magnification. He says the object has to be bright. That's true. Planets uh, would fall in that category for the most part. Marco Polo says, I like to use a 2X Barlow on my 11 millimeter Explore Scientific 82 degree eyepiece to view planets on that daub. Seems to be the limit in my area. Okay. Well, still not bad, you know, so not bad. Not bad. Okay. Well, this is great. Well, you did it again, Kent. So, so the, your, your next level now is going to be, what, what can you do for a thousand bucks, you know? And I think you can do a lot. And oh, so yeah. there's, so, there's going to be more than two that you can <coughs> do, I'm sure. So I would, uh, and we're getting into not at a thousand bucks. We're getting into some a little bit more complicated systems. Yep. Um, you, it's not necessarily just somebody that thinks they might like astronomy. We're, we're reaching that, you know, somebody that's maybe had binoculars, been around telescopes, has been to a star party, has a little bit, maybe better understanding. But again, Scott, you know, people, and I know people have gone off about $10,000 worth of stuff and made it work. And oh, that's we know, true. and we know people who have bought two thousand dollars worth of stuff and couldn't make it work and didn't like it. So you know, right. it's it's it, this gets to be the individual. And I've and seen all this guys stuff. buy five hundred dollar packages, or right. you know, somewhere in between five hundred and a thousand, and they're doing astrophotography and they're doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, like Mike Wiesner always says, you know, if you got a smartphone, uh, you can become an astrophotographer. You know, and um, 
Uh, and he's right. You just need to get the right adapter to fit onto your telescope. Uh, he's got a whole page, a whole gallery of galaxies and nebula and star clusters. And I think he's got a couple of comets in there. And so, um, you know, definitely you can step into astrophotography without having to spend a ton of money because you could, uh, you know, the, the cameras can get real expensive and all the rest of it. But a smartphone and the right app is going to take you a long way and get you that experience. So, so Mike's at Mike's website. It's real simple. It's Wiesner dot com w e a s n e r dot com shout out to mike i'm looking at it right now cassiopeia yep. observatory he's got a real cool logo um uh, but i'm looking iphone moon on uh, uh, iphone moon on sky shed dome uh he's got all sorts of other spaces oh, yeah. here yeah and he i like files, the little dome and it's a little observatory setup it's cool he he files a report of every night he has observing on this site he has you know some people you know, right down there observing, you know, have an observing log. He puts an observing log up every night he does viewing and, and shares it with the world and lots of pretty cool pictures. And yeah. some of them literally with a telephone. Right. A lot of them. A lot of them. <laughs> the telephone. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Thanks, Kent, for uh, all your advice and uh, your selection and everything. Now you're making up uh, pages that that show the uh, your your collections as well. So we'll have to share that on the next show. Yeah, I, I don't actually know if they're active or not. We need to. I've been doing it we'll on one page, we so uh, we need to. It yeah. might want to make it active. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we will put them on. Uh, we'll probably have them on we'll the Port Alliance section. Uh, you know, Kent's. Kent's First Light uh, Chronicles recommendations or something. So anyhow, uh, Dusty says, then once you get an astro camera, you'll wonder how you did it before. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Ron Delbo says, I use a 10 millimeter eyepiece and a 2X Barlow on my camera, then 5X in software on an mm -hmm. eight, 8 inch, sometimes two 2X Barlows. And Richard Gray says, Great show. I love the First Light Chronicles. Thank you, Richard. Hey, and Richard, thanks for being on last night and showing great images. He, uh, Richard was showing um, beautiful uh, deep sky images. We had Andromeda. Uh, we had um, uh, the Pleiades and the Orion Nebula that he got going through the trees and finally out of the trees. So that was cool. Um, but was, uh, he using, was he using his uh, one, First Light 130 Newtonian that he's modified for astrophotography? Or? I forget. I forget which scope he was using. But uh, but uh, anyhow, he got some great images. And uh, he, his image, his uh, his work is getting better all the time. He's just he's showing us just like one shot, you know, exposures. Uh, he's not showing like. Uh, you know, tracked and stacked and processed and all the rest of it. So it's very impressive what he's getting. Oh, that was the ED80, he said, in the carbon fiber. That's right. That's right. Well, guys, thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday. We've got, um, uh, we'll be back with uh, Tyler Bowman and Jerry Hubble uh, for the Open GoTo community. And then, uh, I know I've said it before, but we have the Asian edition of the Global Star Party on Saturday morning, starting at 6 a.m. Central. So you'll want to tune in for that uh, if you can peel yourself out of bed. You guys have a good night, and thank you very, very much. <laughs> That's good. And let's... Bye, everybody. Yep. Good night. Hi guys, this is Tyler, He's a customer service rep with Explorer Scientific. And today I'm here to announce that the Explorer Alliance is excited to be hosting the first astrophotography contest to recognize the excellent work of the images of our members' ranks. For this initial contest, we are looking for the best of the best in seven imaging categories from deep space objects to planetary, lunar, solar, wide field, time lapse, and terrestrial. Prizes will be awarded in each category. 
First place winner will receive a $200 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade in their Explore Alliance membership, and a 24 by 36 mounted print for their winning image. Second place winners will receive a $150 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade to their Explore Alliance membership, and an 18 by 24 mounted print for their winning image. And third place will receive a $100 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade to their Explore Alliance membership, and 11 by 17 print of their winning image. Best in Show will be selected from the first place winners in each of the seven categories. <clears throat> the Best of Show will receive a 24 by 44 mountain print of their winning image in place of the 36 by 24 first place prize. Entries are being accepted through 6 a.m. Central Standard Time to December 24th of 2020. Now before each entry, please be aware of the following rules and requirements. Each entrant must be an Explore Alliance member. If you are not an Explore Alliance member, it is a free program and we will provide you a link in the below in the description so you can sign up. At least one piece of Explore Scientific equipment, telescope, or mount must be used in the capture of the submitted image. Entrants must identify equipment and imaging data in the appropriate sections on the form below. Each entry must be the original work of the entrant. By entering, you are stating that the image is your property and the work that you originally have. Although the contestant entry period is through December 24th, 2020, images outside the taken contestant time periods are eligible for entry. Entrants must read and agree to abide by the rules and photo release at the time of submission. These are the included on the form below. Entrants may enter more than one photo into the contest contest. Again, this is Tyler, a customer service rep along with Explore Alliance. We really hope to see your astrophotography images and we can't wait to see what you can produce. Again, this is Tyler. Clear skies and keep looking up. I thought of myself almost like uh Asian Yeah, I, it just it just in our country you know, with the current oh, you climate I heard that term of you know and I just thought mm, I'll say something. Okay. Saturday is our gala. Are you gonna be able to 